when uh, Professor Wu and a couple of other people asked me to to speak about this, I said, okay, I will see what I can do. I hope that this will be interesting and uh, exciting for you all. Um, but of course, I have to get all the slides approved by the State Department. And so um, that is probably one of the things that is most different for me. Um, I'm used to working on the slides the night before the talk. And this time I couldn't do that. Um, I had to finish them last week and then send them in and then get things reviewed. Um, that's actually one of the lessons that I've learned. And if you want to talk to me about latencies and uh, uh, lag decision and action policies for uh, system integration, I can spend a lot of time talking about that. But that's not exactly what I'm going to cover t today, or at least not right away. So what I am going to cover is the discussion of um, the roles that uh, engineers and scientists can play in the broader, um, the broader environment of uh, policy making, decision making, and, and, and to, not to, to uh, sound too uh, overblown about it, but basically the, uh, how, how scientists and engineers can operate in the geopolitical realm. And that is uh, something that if you had asked me a few years ago, I would have given you a very, very different answer. But I think my uh, time in Washington has given me a very uh, particularly uh, 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 evolved view of, of that experience. And so the picture that, that I'm showing in this uh, uh, initial view is uh, actually one of our uh, one of our class pictures, if you will, with uh, uh, members of the uh, State Department, including the man in gen uh, in in the center, was the uh, previous deputy sec uh, deputy secretary Anthony Blinken, and one of his comments was, uh, and one of the reasons why he thought that the Jefferson uh, a program was a, a very good thing was sometimes he said I need scientists and engineers in the room to let me know if I need scientists and engineers in the room and this was a really interesting comment to recognize that there are a number of policy discussions that have scientific and engineering components to them that people who are not um, depth experts in those areas they may not know that uh, but it's hard for them to figure out, oh, I needed somebody to tell me about this aspect of information technology or, or that aspect of healthcare. Uh, not just the policy, but the, oh, this is how that work gets done. Or this is how those sorts of scientific uh, discoveries are made. And so uh, uh, this was actually one, one of the uh, primary uh, mechanisms that, that we were able to operate on over the course of the year. And I would say in a lot of ways, for me, uh, the, the process of living in Washington for a year was after being a faculty member for a very long time, as, as Andrew pointed out, I, I guess I'm now officially an old fart. Um, this was going back to school. This was a, a year-long study abroad, if you will. Uh, so let me talk a little bit about uh, what I experienced, uh, the, the agenda. This is a uh, presentation that uh, I hope that will generate some, some questions. So please feel free to, to ask questions along the way or save them up for the end. Uh, that's OK. Um, I'm going to give you a little bit of background about the Jefferson Science Fellowship Program and the application process, transitioning in, and an unexpectedly uh, challenging piece was also transitioning back. Uh, so that, that will, will cover much of what I want to talk about today. So some ground rules. As I said, please ask questions. Um, this is an unclassified presentation. 
So uh, since there are multiple audiences and multiple assumptions, that it, it's really important that it, if I say something and slip into uh, the acronyms of the State Department, please pull me back. Um, and one of the acronyms that you'll see a lot, actually you'll see it on every slide, is the uh, Group Performance Environments Research Lab. That, that's our research uh, lab uh, here in IE. And um, you can go find it at Grouper Lab. Actually, you can also find it at grouperlab.org. So. so let me talk a little bit to start about the Jefferson Science Fellowship Program. Uh, this is a program that... Uh, as as Andrew pointed out, is a on a, an awarded program. Um, it is uh, named for Thomas Jefferson, who was the first United States Secretary of State. He was a lawyer by initial training. He was a scientist by uh, personality, I guess. Uh, he he liked doing experiments with the uh, farm yields at uh, Monticello. Uh, he was a diplomat, obviously, and he was a policymaker, wor working on both the design of the United States as, an, as a policy experiment and interactions with uh, other nations as a representative. So there was probably no uh, stronger uh, name or designation that they could put on uh, the Jefferson Science Fellowship Program as to represent someone whose work is in the sciences and engineering, um, who is working uh, in support of policy for the United States. Uh, the, the program itself was announced by Secretary of State Colin Powell in 2013 based on a National Academy of Sciences uh, report that was commissioned by the prior Secretary of State Madeleine Albright, and actually she was the one who was in the portrait. Uh, so that, that's an especially valuable picture for us. Uh, and the idea, uh, sort of the same model as Vannevar Bush's uh, Endless Frontier report at, uh, in 1946 at the end of World War II, is recognizing we have this tremendous uh, resource, this capability for uh, using scientific knowledge to advance our understanding, not just of the scientific and built environment, but of the, ge of the geographic and political environment. And that uh, we should use those capabilities to uh, improve our understanding of an increasingly connected, increasingly complex, increasingly challenging uh, global environment. And so let's, uh, let's have th such a program. And one of the differences between the United States and many other nations is that the, uh, our National Academies uh, efforts, National Academies of Sciences, Engineering, and Medicine, is an honor-based rather than a just a status-based or for-pay type of assignment. So people are named to the academies, and they do that stuff, in essence, for free. Um, yes, I got paid a salary to do this, but I did not get paid additional con money by the U.S. government to do this. It's considered an honor that people do on, be on behalf of national service, if you will. Now, this is a long uh, blah, blah uh, uh, paragraph, actually, this comes straight from the National Academy sites, um, that, it, that the goal is to build cooperative bridges between the academic community and the federal government, uh, focusing on tenured scientists and engineers who are able to work either in the Department of State or the U.S. Agency for International Development. And, and in my class, there were, there were two or three people who actually uh, worked in AID to uh, provide, again, scientific expertise and analysis to policymakers. Uh, and policymakers is a very broad uh, group, and I'll give you a little bit more explanation in a bit. And so the idea is that we learn more about how people who aren't scientists and engineers approach 
that complex thing called policymaking. And the idea is that um, we need to be able to, to apply our skill sets in support of the discussions that uh, go on in a variety of international domains. My expertise historically as a systems engineer means that I think about how people get, share, and use information. I think about the, the roles of technology development and technology use in society. I uh, spend a lot of time, again, uh, you might have noticed on the picture, yes, I spend some time thinking about spaceflight things, um, but I also spend some time thinking about healthcare things uh, and other types of human interactions with technology. And uh, since I also spend a lot of my time thinking about the entire world as nested feedback control loops, um, which uh, is maybe not as smooth a cocktail party introduction as, a, as I might want. I, I got a, a lot of cocktail party uh, practice during my year, and I'll tell you a little bit more about that. So let me talk a little bit about the application process. I, I see a couple of, uh, uh, can I say younger faculty or just um, colleagues who are, are still earlier in their, in their academic journey. So if you think about doing this, you've got some time, okay? Um, but for all of you, I want you to think a little bit about how the application process for the Jefferson was in, in many ways very unlike any, any other application process I've gone through in my career. And it's, an, it's, an, it's a multi-stage application process. Um, one stage is you have to be nominated by your campus, which means internal as well as external letters of reference. And uh, since this is a national program of some prestige, um, those letters are saying, okay, this person really knows some stuff. But there's a commitment letter by the campus basically saying that we're going to let this nominee work for the U.S. government for a year and we'll pay them, which is a massive commitment on the part of the university. So in, in one sense, I think that this is not just uh, an, an honor and, an and a recognition of the nominee, but also of the campus for making that sort of commitment to, uh, to enable faculty to, to work in, in this sort of environment. Uh, and, and really, it is a, an, an offering of national service. The, once you, uh, you are nominated by your campus, you get to go through a, a multi-stage application process. And the, uh, now, we're talking about a national competition, uh, which is in some ways kind of like you know, a, 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 a career or a, a grad, uh, an NSF, a grad research fellowship. You've got, to re you've got to show some stuff. You've got to write some essays. Um, you've got to talk about your experience. Um, and then there's a down select with interviews at the National Academy's buildings, which in, I mentioned the cocktail party interview. Part of the interview process does happen during an, uh, during an evening reception because they want to see which of these scientists and engineers can operate well in a semi-formal environment when they are representing a much larger entity than their own career. So when I, when I <laughs> be careful when you ever say, no, I don't do this, or no, I will never be interested in this. Because as it turns out, um, I, I said for several years, I don't do policy. I, I don't, I, because I thought of doing policy as being a political science major who writes a, a document and you're done when the document gets turned into a law or it gets turned into a designation at the G7 or something like that. 
I didn't have any understanding of all of the discussion and development and negotiation that goes into writing policy or the ability to recognize the impact of a policy on social or technical or organizational dynamics. Uh, fortunately, though, I did have uh, some uh, folks from the academies convince me that when I was writing uh, papers or developing new courses to talk about systems thinking, systems engineering, uh, the role of technology in uh, broader organizations, that really I was doing uh, policy making types of work. Um, I had also worked with the frontiers of engineering, both the US and the German American frontiers of engineering, so I had more of an idea of how to interact with uh, international colleagues on technical areas of interest where they were working from a different cultural grounding of, well, this is how uh, universities in our uh, country work, here's how universities and industry work together, here's how we make these distinctions. Um, we, I'd also done some uh, international teaching in Sweden and some curriculum development in Kuwait. Now, at the time, I was not designing myself for this program because actually f for much of this work w was, some of this was actually before the Jefferson existed. But that's one of the challenges of recognizing that there are many components that don't always start with a strategic linear combination of effects. You have to be able to say, here are the things that I want to do now, and here are the ranges of opportunities that it enables in, in the future. And we could, tell that, we could talk about that as a process of uh, enhancing system robustness or requisite variety. The more opportunities that you allow yourself to happen, the more responsive you can be to new changes in, in, in the environment. Um, also, uh, I spend a bunch of time doing uh, science, technology, engineering, and math engagement and public communication. That's the Indiana Space Grant Director stuff. It's basically telling people in the public about why STEM is important and why NASA is valuable in your life and why we did not uh, shut down the program just when we uh, stopped flying shuttles. Um, it's actually a very interesting uh, experience to find out how large the gap is between what we think of as basic knowledge and what the public understands. And I think that's especially important when you start interacting with a, a broader context of people in a political or, or other non research conference environment, if you will. So in the, in the essays, imagine that you're asked a question about how a technical analysis will influence global policy. As it turns out, when I was writing, the, when I was writing my essays, was just about the time that uh, the Volkswagen emission scandal started becoming a relatively uh, publicized event from the technical perspective. This ended up, since then, being a fairly substantial global policy issue. But the question was, at the time, how could one's technical understanding of how research and development works in an organization help you understand what was going on, not, uh, not just in the organizational liability perspective, but how that plays out in uh, international environmental policy. Uh, the, the other essay, uh, essay was one that we spend a lot of time talking about, and even the campus now has this uh, discussion of data sciences initiative. But, what are the cultural factors that influence our, our appreciation of data? And not just subcultures within community, scientific communities at a university like Purdue, but different national cultures, 
different psychological perspectives on responding to data. Uh, and again, the, that influences how we discuss with our uh, colleagues in a, in a more uh, international or geopolitical environment. And in fact, one of the interview questions actually talked about how would you interact with a non-scientist. So it, if someone comes to you and uh, says, well, I don't believe in this theory of disease transmission. Now, that sounds quite bizarre. There, there's a non-trivial non number of people in, in the world who would not understand a concept like herd immunity to, uh, based on vaccination. Okay. It is probably not a good idea to respond to them by saying, you flaming idiot, haven't you read the recent papers that have put this to bed and clearly you have no business taking up space? That, I would suggest, is not an effective way of engaging uh, partners or uh, supporters in any sort of collaborative environment. Unfortunately, we've seen scientists and engineers who actually basically act that way. So I'm asking you, don't be that person. Okay. What's also important is that based on where where they're from. And in one sense, I don't have to explain that to this room because I'm looking at this room and I'm seeing people who have come to Purdue from a large number of places around the world. Okay. But imagine people who haven't had the same sort of discipline training that you have as people representing different cultures. So once you've gone through all of that and gone from, you know, maybe a half dozen people on your campus to one of a couple hundred applicants to a couple dozen that uh, uh, go to D.C. For, for a trip, and then you get, you get the letter saying, you're a fellow. Come back to D.C., and we're going to do something called Bid Week. I found out later, this is exactly the way State Department assignments happen. Imagine that you get a binder full of opportunities, and I know that, that there's a political story about a binder full of something, but really, it's a binder with a bunch of job applications, different desks, bureaus, and offices across the State Department that say, we would like a person to be able to do this for a year. And, there, and basically, the State Department is broken up into two classes of bureaus. There are regional bureaus and the offices within the bureaus that cover one or more countries, like Japan, like Sweden, like Micronesia. And then there are functional bureaus that cover a particular topic like in intelligence or economics. And there's some overlap, there's some matricity between them, but for the purposes of this discussion, uh, think of them as different approaches to um, your system boundary. The regional bureaus focus on a part of the world and anything related to environment, science, technology, and health that happens related to any geopolitical event. So if, if you're on the Japan desk, which is where I ended up, it's basically Japan. But anything in a range of science and technology domains related to some geopolitical event somewhere between here and Tokyo. A functional bureau more frequently has stable long-term projects on a specialized area of, of expertise. So you tend to do that specialty more often in a wider variety of locations. 
Now, as it turns out, based on the background that I showed you about my own career, oh, did we want to say in initial conditions? Um, I was actually more suited for a regional position than a uh, functional position because I work on a variety of different project areas. Yeah. So in terms of organizational hierarchy, was this also a matrix in terms of how you reported through, like the regional office could also have a functional component as well? Is, is that how they coordinate it across? Uh, that's, a, that's a good question. Organizations try to do that. Right. And, and, a, and a lot of people do uh, think about matrix organizations. Um, in, in this sense, not necessarily. The, um, it's not a matrix reporting structure. So um, when, uh, let me get to that in just a moment, okay? Um, but that's a, that's a great question. Um, because people in the regional bureaus often work with the people in the functional bureaus but the reporting looks a little bit different. And uh, basically they say, hey, it's Monday. Here, here, here's your binder. Give us your top three choices by Friday. And all the offices that you interview with also will gov give us their top three choices by Friday. And you try to match them. And so it's basically a two or three week process, starting with about 35 potential offices and a dozen fellows trying to match who gets to go where. So I've talked about the application. Let's talk about what it, what it, what it means to start in such an environment. You come in, uh, it, it's August, and in Washington, D.C., August means it's very, very hot. The day that I walked in, the, the day that I arrived with my U-Haul uh, stuff and, and things, and we, and, and we drove in, and, and uh, a friend of mine are, are, are navigating the streets, and the first bank thermometer sign I see says like 128 p.m., 100 degrees. So it's like, oh joy, this is going to be my experience in Washington. Um, but, but seriously, this is a large bureaucratic organization operating in a large, complex environment that uh, basically we had a, a one-week seminar called Washington Tradecraft of how to write documents, how to put together ideas, how to figure out who knows what and, and where to find these out. And, and in some of my work in, in uh, distributed expertise, we talk about different dimensions of expertise, including expert identification and management of uh, communication interfaces and communication effectiveness, as well as subject matter domain expertise. So in fact, this was fitting right into stuff that, that, I, that I teach now I was getting to learn. I want to distinguish between two uses of the, me of the word clearance. Security clearance means the sort of shh level of what projects you're allowed to work on. There is also a process called document clearance. And this is something that basically everybody needs to do within the State Department. And it is a process from an engineering perspective that I think of as alignment and coupling. Okay? It is confirming that others in the State Department as your agency and other U.S. government agencies both agree and approve the message that you're trying to send so that other people know what it is that you're trying to say. They are aligned with it and heading in the same direction. And 
individual words matter profoundly because you might be writing an international treaty. You might be distinguishing whether or not you are for or against a particular United Nations resolution. So this, this idea of who are your stakeholders, who are your equities, that's where a lot of the matricity comes from because you're saying, well, this is an important technical issue, but these 58 countries don't actually do any work in this area, but these 14 do. So we need to recognize the countries that may have a regional equity, we need to communicate with those regional bureaus. Okay, does that answer that question better? Okay. So, welcome to the Japan desk. So that's, that's where I ended up. Uh, that was actually my first choice. I thought that was great. I, I thought it was fantastic. Um, for those of you who've known me for a while, this was my daily dress, which is kind of unusual. It, I, I didn't used to dress like this very often. I, I had many of these clothes, but I, I'm an academic. I don't have to. This was just this was standard wear. Because you never know when the ambassador might be dropping by. And uh, maybe it's the deputy finance minister or the um, CFO of some major company. And as it turns out, within the first month that I was working, we actually were right, uh, putting together some language for a trilateral agreement on cancer moonshot with the Republic of Korea and, and Japan. There was an Our Oceans International Conference that was hosted at the Department of State. So I come in one day and there are areas roped off because there are VIP diplomats from all over the world. And I, I was working with the science and technology advisor to the secretary um, on a joint paper with his corresponding science and technology advisor in Japan on the role of science diplomacy. That's my first month. So that was quite a, a, an exciting, sort of humbling level of um, ramp up, and especially because for someone who is used to being an academic, I write my papers for me, okay? I, I work with my students and people know me as that. But in this environment, it's working with equities, it's working with other offices, representing the United States. So it's a, it's a, it's a very different feeling about what is, again, I, I'm an engineer. What's the objective function? And it's a very different objective function. So critical lessons. I used to be pretty obnoxious when I would teach the capstone design course about uh, you have to have a project notebook. You have to have a hard copy project notebook. You take your project notebook everywhere, all the time, to your project site. And Bill was actually uh, may, uh, heard me rant about this. Well, yeah, project notebooks. This is technically not an official project notebook, but. It was, one, it was one of my notebooks. And actually reminded me of the importance of note-taking habits. Why? Because in some of the offices, you're not allowed to take electronic devices. But I already told you that words matter profoundly for information alignment and coupling. So relying on one's memory is not a very good idea in these sorts of environments. Very, very cool uh, pattern that we used to have called uh, huddles. And so uh, imagine, uh, actually Japan is a relatively large country desk, so there's about a dozen of us. And the uh, calls a meeting, 
You got eight, 10, 12 people in a room, and they all go around and spend three to five minutes talking about this is what's going on in my area that you need to know about. So in about 30 or 40 minutes, it's basically, here's what's going on for this country and for our strategic needs and tactical requirements. We've got to have a meeting with these people. This, uh, this ambassador or this member of the cabinet is going to be doing this. We, we need to be ready for this meeting. We need to be ready for this initiative. Okay. Um, Actually, we had a lot of short meetings. It was a big deal to be able to have a 15-minute or a 30-minute meeting. The idea of a, of a one-hour meeting was, I, I don't want to say unheard of, but extremely rare. And it was basically for very, very high-level meetings. So we got much, much better at figuring out what's the most important thing for this person that I'm talking to to know and how to explain that very, very quickly. Okay. There's also a process of information integration and synthesis because you're reading cables literally from all over the world. So I would come in the morning and on a country desk, I, I would have one set of cables. Somebody was in a functional bureau might be reading a different set, a subset of the cables. But I'm reading from Apia, um, which is in Samoa, Dili, Suva, which is Fiji. Um, Dili, I believe, is Timor-Leste. Um, and you start seeing all these additional connections. Now, for me, I love to scan and connect. I love to make those sorts of coordination efforts for somebody who is much more systematic and singular in their emphasis, this is a very, very challenging experience. Because there's no single thing to work on. And again, if you can imagine where your daily operations related to global organizations change daily, that could be a little bit of a challenge. So let me give you a little bit more of an example of a regular day. Well, not a regular day because there weren't that many regular days. Um, but this picture is actually from McPherson Square. Um, there, there's a metro station that you can't see, but there's, there's, a, there's a guy on a horse named McPherson. That's his square. That and uh, the arrow points to my, uh, my, my window. So I, I decided if I'm going to live in Washington, D.C. for a year, I'm going to have the Washington, D.C. experience. So I'm living downtown. It is fantastic. It is wonderful. There were more, there was probably about 30 good restaurants within a 10 or 15 minute walk of my apartment. And I was right next to a metro station, which is really, really fantastic, which means you also are next to a metro station, which means there are buses and trains running most of the night. Okay, so it gets loud, and it's a little bit stressful, and there are a lot of people, and it's kind of, yeah. But again, I'm talking about distinguishing regional and functional bureaus. One of, the, one of the jobs in a, in a regional bureau is something that we would call daily report. And so basically for one week every two months, two to three months ago, I would get up at 4.45, somewhere 4.45, maybe if I were feeling really, really um, hard charging, I might get up as late as 5, 5.15 get up, get on my suit, get, get my food, get ready to go. Because I need to be in the office between 6.30 and 6.45. I need to 
review cables and media reports from around the world. So I'm checking my news feed. I am checking things that come in through the, the department uh, email servers. And I need to pick the top three things that are important. And I only get, to use, I only get five lines to describe them. By the way, if you pick four, or one of them goes to six lines in standard format, they'll send it back. How do I know this? Because I've done four, and they say, which is the top three? I've done six lines, and they say, cut out nine words. And everybody in the region has to do that by 7.30 in the morning. So the bureau director, which is basically a deputy assistant secretary, is able to walk into an 8 o'clock meeting and say, here is my world. Here is my part of the literal planet. And everything that we think that is important for us to pay attention to. So a lot of sifting, a lot of focusing, a lot of uh, filtering, damping, if you will. And it's this process of integrating environment, science, technology, and health, ESTH, in international diplomacy. Now notice, ESTH is one desk. That's one specialty, if you will, for a regional bureau. They might have three political officers, four economic officers, and one person to cover all of ESTH. And you're supposed to be able to figure out what are today's issues as well as long-term trends. There's something about um, mining this mineral. What do we do about that? Okay. What level of expertise is required? This was a real challenge for me because in the academic environment, you know, if you want to say that you know something about a domain, you better have like degrees and papers and and stuff like that. It's like, well, actually, Barrett, you know more about how clinical trials in medicine work than any of us. So, congratulations, you're the clinical trials expert. Blech. Okay. So a regional bureau is everything ESTH for your place. And a functional bureau is your specialty wherever it might show up. So really, and I've done this in three different uh, uh, U.S. agencies, government agencies. This was one of my most um, fascinating experiences with complex system dynamics at the, at the social as well as technical perspective because you're working in a large organization with work hours, uh, hours with a work tempo and so that tempo of operations for a global enterprise is, is very interesting. One of our interesting advantages, and we would talk about this, is that working with Japan was very, very cool because we would go home about the time Mission Japan was coming into the office and Mission Japan was going home about the time that we were coming in. So in essence, our operations could be 24-7 or 24-5. Okay. Other countries had to organize their work tempo a little bit differently because of the time zone issues. Um, and you're living in a company town. So on a federal holiday, Suddenly, everybody's wandering around. Um, on a Saturday, it's much harder to, to find a, a lunch place that's open that doesn't have tourists in it. Um, you're also managing a bureaucracy. And again, um, being faculty, where I'm representing myself or maybe my discipline, to foreign affairs, where I'm representing a country. And it, it sounded kind of bizarre until the day we were actually taking that I will uh, uphold and defend the Constitution of the United States. Oh, this is really foreign affairs. Um, and you're supposed to be sharing information to all the stakeholders and equities and then figuring out which information can I and can I not share. 
and then learning the office culture. Um, and there's also global connection points because you are interacting with embassies and diplomats, people who have a very similar understanding, but they've been bouncing about the world. One of the interesting things about the State Department, um, th this is true not just for, for us, but other uh, foreign affairs ministries, you rarely stay in one office for more than two or three years. To be successful, you will move from office to office, from region to region, from specialty to specialty. They talk about being in grade in cone, and you have to have some assignments outside of your original cone in order to be an effectively broad diplomat. Um, obviously, you're working with branches of government. You're also working with other companies as well as general citizens. So most people start in a consular office where they're stamping visas. Okay. And that's how you start to learn about interacting and how a policy plays out in people's lives. Really, this is system dynamics without much engineering. And so for, the, for those who've heard about or seen me uh, in my perspectives on systems engineering class, this is what I call SE1. It's the system dynamics for people who actually don't have the background in the mathematics or the engineering behavior or the, uh, the descriptive analytics of uh, operations research, it's, it's how they access these concepts. And why do I say without engineering? There are very few engineers. The story I like to tell is imagine someone who graduated, you know, honors, cum laude, in science, uh, no, not in science, no, no, they did not do it in science. Maybe French, maybe colonial history. They get a, they get a Rhodes or a Marshall Scholarship. They, um, they ace their language exam. They get a master's in international relations. They are fast tracking their way to the seventh floor of the State Department building. They could have done all of that and never taken a class in the application of the scientific method. And for those people who have, the, the ultimate would be a STEM PhD. They're about, I was up, I was corrected on this one. I thought it was more than this. It's about 250 STEM PhDs out of 11,000 employees. So there's very little engineering concentration in the State Department. Actually, there's very little engineering concentration in Washington, D.C. at all. Even at AAAS, there's not that Ameri uh, American Association for the Advancement of Science. There's very little engineering. Okay. In ways that I didn't know before I got there, we speak a language in STEM. And we have a process of scientific method and hypothesis testing. You can debate all you want, but data is what drives us. That's not true in other disciplines. So I think of engineering within STEM as, OK, how do we apply uh, principles of science to actually build things and do things. Not just why is it so, but what do we do about it. Okay? Um, and so when you're talking to somebody who's writing policy, they, they say, well, I want to be able to do this. And, they, and you want to say, that's very, very nice, but physics won't let you. No, 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 what if, what if we offer them this? It's like, no, you can't offer physics anything. Physics will or will not let you. No matter how rich you are, laws of physics still apply. And this is the process of managing the world versus building it. And one of the things that I've learned is very few engineers actually think about the management of the world that they want to build. And so you need to know the limits to non-expert understanding. Most people don't understand the difference. And it's your job to explain it to them. And you have to uncover the limits to, uh, 
Andrew will have a beverage sometime. Rational optimization is a fantasy. Okay? I know that's almost, almost blasphemous. But it is not something that most people in this environment do. Okay? And we can't just blame them for not being rational actors with uh, some sort of steep ascent gradient for behavior. They're not going to get there. Okay? STEM engagement in public communication. I said that was one of the most important things that I was able to bring into this. But how much is the, the public really able to understand? And so people will talk about diplomacy is the art of the possible, not the art of the optimal. There's another phrase that I w didn't necessarily want to put on, on the slide because the, then I would have gotten that reviewed, is diplomacy is the art of when you tell people to go to hell, they ask for directions. That's Winston Churchill, by the way. So as I finish up, I have just a, a few minutes, I guess. Um, oh, that, that was actually on Secretary Kerry's last day. I happened to be standing in the right place that he ended up shaking my hand. So that was really cool. And it's very, very crucial that if you want to engage with them effectively, you understand that stance and worldview. Make your own evident and known and engage them on theirs where they are. Okay? And then the, the value of appropriate parsing and basically breaking things up into nice discrete as in small useful chunks but also discrete as in recognize not to ask someone a question that uh, uh, proper politeness or etiquette forbids them to answer. And so being able to project the discussion, project the understanding, project the dynamics of, of the conversation from the other person's perspective as well as your own. I think a lot about who do I represent when I'm in a meeting in, in Tokyo and I look around and I realize, oh, um, Barrett's the United States of America today. <laughs> okay. There's an event in Indianapolis, or actually we did a capstone design course looking at policy analysis for the State Department. It was a fascinating project. Again, I, I've, I, I don't want to spend... Um, too much time reiterating, but I said that this was systems engineering, and I think about systems engineering all the time. Being able to be proactive in interacting with people and applying global lessons uh, learned to campus activities. So I don't think about Purdue the same way I did before I left, and um, that's interesting. Um, people in this world value networks. They value experiences. I didn't bring it with me, but one of the most valuable things that I got was the, the set of business cards. For, for those of you who are kind of new generation next or whatever it is, make some business cards, really. Um, those connections are what people remember, and that's how they start uh, analyzing what qualifications are and what techniques people have for interacting. Okay? And they'll say, oh, you're that guy who helped us do this thing. And um, I'm, too, I'm still too current in the process to actually be able to tell you the end story of how often that happens. But I've already started to see some bits of it. So I think that is more than enough. Um, let me finish by saying thank you to my colleagues at the Japan desk, the Korea desk, um, lots of people throughout the, the State Department. In fact, um, when, when I left, my, uh, the, the friends at uh, the Japan desk actually gave me this um, pin and cufflink set because they said, well, Barrett, you're somebody who would actually wear it. So that was great. Um, the other members of the Jefferson Science Fellows class, 
Um, officially, I must say that I continue my tenure as a, as a remotely based foreign affairs office, officer, uh, supporting the Office of Japanese Affairs. I have official work that I need to do next week. Um, and of course, these remarks are my personal observations and do not represent the official positions of the United States of America or any of its agencies. So uh, thank you very much. Thank you.